My name is Sarah Son. I am the Victoria Area Representative for the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers um, in Victoria, BC, in case we have people joining us from uh, farther afield. Today, uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and as Quimo First Nations communities, for allowing, allowing us to live, work, and play on their lands. Just a couple of um, administrative things here to get out of the way. Please remember to mute your mics if it isn't already. We will uh, have time for questions and comments later. We welcome them and we have uh, reserved some time for uh, discussion at the end. Please type in any questions or comments into the chat box. Then we will, uh, we will read out those questions for the speakers at the end of the event. Please indicate if you'd like to ask your questions anonymously, you can send them to me directly as, as a private message. And I will, um, I, will, uh, I will not use your name when I ask the question. We'd like to acknowledge the two sponsoring law firms for this event. Two Victoria law firms have very generously agreed to make donations. That's Carfer Lawton and Chris Harmon. The two speakers for the event today have asked that in lieu of their usual speaker fees, that a donation be made to a local community organization in recognition of their efforts and time. And they've asked that the Intercultural Association of Victoria be that organization. They are a, a community organization that su supports immigrants. And uh, as you will see, that's a very fitting organization to, to receive the donation. This event is being recorded in speaker view and will be distributed after the event. So please turn off your video if you don't want to be caught in the recording for this event. Those are all uh, our housekeeping matters out of the way. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Judge Marika Omatsu. Judge Omatsu was appointed to the Ontario Court of Justice in 1993 and was the first woman of East Asian descent to be appointed a judge in Canada. She continues to be actively involved um, in the legal profession and teaches and lectures in Canada and abroad. She's also the co-founder of the Federation of Canadian, Asian Canadian Lawyers, which is, of course, um, the host for this event. She's received numerous awards, including an honorary doctorate of laws from Ryerson University, the Order of Ontario, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association Trailblazer of the Year Award, and finally, the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers Lifetime Achievement Award. She will be providing some background for the two judgments, the Supreme Court of Canada judgment and the Judicial Committee of the Previous Council judgment in the reference case of the persons of Japanese race and also introduce our two speakers. So uh, I will hand things over to Judge Omatsu at this time. Thanks, Sarah, uh, for the kind introduction. It's very exciting for me to be involved with tonight's FACL BC webinar. 15 years ago, I co-founded FACL with a friend, Legal Aid Clinic Director Avi Go in Toronto. Fast forward uh, 14 years to a few days ago, I attended the through the REMO platform, Faculty Ontario's 14th annual conference. The keynote speaker was William Lee, Harvard's lawyer, defending Harvard's affirmative action program for disadvantaged minorities. Ex-President Donald Trump had the White House legal, a, legal team lean in, thankfully unsuccessfully. However, the case is headed for the US Supreme Court. Over the two days of the conference, there were panels on Asian model minority myth, 
so the support for African Canadian uh, community, um, AI, and uh, mistakes made by seasoned council, among other topics. I encourage you to look at the FACA websites for Ontario, BC, and Western. In today's internet world, no plane tickets are required to sit in and meet your colleagues across the country. And actually, when we did the breakouts, we all sat in tables of about six or so people. And at my last uh, table, there was some uh, woman who worked for Alibaba in London, uh, a woman who was a student in India, myself in Vancouver, three in Toronto, one in Ottawa, and one in, um, I think, Alberta. Anyway, so I do think that, that if you have the chance, please take a look at their websites. Tonight, I can promise you that we are in for an interesting evening. And before we move into the heavy hitters, whom I will introduce, I'm going to paint the backdrop against which Professors Stanger Ross and Adams presentations can be viewed. I apologize to those in the audience for whom these remarks are familiar. For most of our history in British Columbia, Japanese immigrants were subjected to virulent racism. Like First Nations peoples and Chinese immigrants, Japanese lived in an apartheid world, denied the vote, denied rights of citizenship, denied entry into professions, and in their daily life, restricted admission into restaurants, swimming pools, and theaters. For Japanese Canadians, World War II gave racist politicians and opportunists the chance they've been looking for, what today is called ethnic cleansing, ridding BC and Canada of Japanese Canadians. Under the cover of the War Measures Act, the entire community of 22,000 was removed from their homes and communities on the west coast of BC, sent to internment camps in the interior. Families were broken up as men were sent to build the Trans-Canada Highway and families to sugar beet farms in the prairies. All their possessions were seized and sold by the government. And in 1945, the community was given the choice of exile to Japan or relocation to Eastern Canada. My family chose the second option and that's why I was born in Hamilton, Ontario. Tonight, we will examine the three orders in councils that were passed, authorizing the deportation and exile of Japanese Canadians. Almost to the day, 75 years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the three orders in council that sanctioned the exiling of Canadian citizens to a country most did not know. When I was a law student, I was taught that Canada was a country governed by law through legislation passed by elected politicians and court cases decided by the Supreme Court of Canada or other courts. None of my professors examined the losing cases, nor did they question why they lost. If my law profs had taken this line of inquiry, the legal losses of the Japanese Canadian community during the first half of the 20th century would have revealed how systemic racism was legislated by politicians, then often protected and shielded by judges. Tonight, we are going on such a journey, ably led by professors Eric Adams and Jordan Stanger Ross. Professor Adams is Vice Dean of Law at the University of Alberta and is a member of the Landscapes of Injustice Research Collective, which has studied the dispossession of the Japanese Canadian community, which is the second largest in the history of Canada. Eric Adams is a wonderful lecturer and has received several awards for his research and teaching. Eric is one of the few professors who teaches not only the winning cases, but also the losers. Uh, Professor Adams has published such a paper on how Japanese Canadians shaped the constitution. He examined the Japanese Canadian community losses, which illustrated the racism that was uh, often upheld by our highest courts. If I had had a law prof like Professor Adams, I certainly would have enjoyed law school more. Professor Stanger Ross, pardon me, <laughs> of the University of Victoria has a 22 page academic CV. Rather than summarize it, I will tell you why 
the Japanese Canadian community owes Jordan a debt of gratitude. He led the Landscapes of Injustice project that documented the total dispossession of the Japanese community. His paper, Suspect Properties, exposed the city of Vancouver's single-minded interest in acquiring Japanese Canadian properties in the Powell Street neighborhood of Vancouver that snowballed into wholesale confiscation. His research has helped the community make a case for redress against the city of Vancouver. He recently published a book in collaboration with others that lays bare that racism of many white British Columbians who profited from the removal and detention of the community and the judges who made it all legal. <clears throat> Pardon me. The landscape of injustice research provides the Japanese Canadian community ammunition in its ongoing redress, redress negotiations with the province of BC. Fittingly, in 2018, Jordan received the Award of Excellence from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. The, the CRRF was one of the terms of the 1988 Japanese Canadian Redress Settlement. I now turn it over to our two professors. Hi, um, Judge Amatsu, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, is my sound coming in clearly? Can uh, I get a thumbs up, Marika, if you can hear me well? Okay, terrific. Uh, well, let me start by saying that, uh, Marika, if you're ever looking to head back to law school, uh, I can make it happen for you. I, I, think, uh, I think we'd be a good combo. Um, and really want to honor uh, the work of, of Jordan Stanger Ross tonight. It was Jordan who more than a decade ago uh, pulled me um, into this, into this uh, incredible line of research because he was of the view that um, Canadians did not know this extraordinary and extraordinarily uh, sad and difficult history as well as they should. So 10 years later, I'm uh, still working uh, with my friend and colleague and um, I'm so happy to be here tonight to speak about a remarkable anniversary because uh, 75 years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, issued a remarkable decision uh, in a remarkable moment of injustice. So Jordan, why don't we start with uh, my first slide. And what you'll see before you is the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, under construction on uh, the right-hand side and the interior of the courtroom, the, the walnut-lined, beautiful interior courtroom that, that uh, we have today. Um, in 1940, when the court was completed, and that's just after the image you see on your screen, the Supreme Court of Canada finally inherited a grand modern courthouse befitting its status as what would soon be the highest court in the land in Canada. The court had recently ruled that a law passed by parliament abolishing appeals to, then, to what was then Canada's highest court of appeal, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in Britain, the court said that, that the law abolishing those appeals was constitutional. In effect, they said, we can finally be supreme. For the first time in its Canada, for the first time in its history, the Supreme Court of Canada would be truly supreme. But the Second World War had other plans, both for that grand new courthouse and for the law abolishing appeals to the Privy Council. In 1940, <clears throat> after the building was completed, Rather than hand it over to nine judges on the Supreme Court, the government of Canada that it would use the grand new building on Wellington Street, just to the west of, uh, to the yes, just to the west of Parliament, uh, overlooking the Ottawa Valley, the government decided that would be its building during the war, and so they filled it with civil servants and bureaucrats to conduct war work. As for that law that abolished the appeals to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the government said that would have to wait until the war had ended. Finally then, in 1946, 75 years ago, the Supreme Court building was finally handed over to the Supreme Court. And the very first case it heard 
on January 24th and 25th of 1946 was a case that asked whether Canada could exile its own citizens on racial grounds to a country devastated by war. The first case was the constitutionality of the exile of Japanese Canadians. The government of Canada spared no expense in arguing that their orders exiling Japanese Canadians was legal. They hired then Canada's top lawyer, Aimé Geoffrion, to argue that the powers of government during wartime were essentially unlimited and that the government could deport or exile anyone whom they selected. To effect that plan, the government of Canada had uh, enacted or proposed to enact three different orders. I'm gonna talk about two of them on December the 15th, 1945. The first order stated that, and here I'll quote, during the course of the war with Japan, certain Japanese nationals manifested their sympathy with or support of Japan by making requests for repatriation to Japan. And quote, it is considered necessary by reason of the war for the security, defense, peace, order, and welfare of Canada to authorize what the orders would then go on to refer to as the deportation of Japanese nationals, naturalized British subjects, and even Canadian born uh, persons, quote, of the Japanese race. The order stipulated that any wife or child under 16 of a person who had signed what was called a repatriation form would also de be, be deported. The second order noted that anyone who had signed such a repatriation form had, quote, manifested their sympathy with or support of the enemy powers and have by such, such actions shown themselves to be unfit for permanent residence in Canada. That order would then strip the Canadian citizenship of anyone who was being deported. The lawyers for what was called the Cooperative Committee of Japanese Canadians, their lawyer, Robert Cartwright, shortly himself to be appointed to the Supreme Court, Andrew Bruin, a Toronto lawyer, and Arthur McLennan, a lawyer in Vancouver. All three of them argued that such a power could not be contained within the War Measures Act. They argued that the definition of Japanese race was also unenforceably vague. But Robert Cartwright hoped to grab the Supreme Court's attention by opening his case in this way. He said, if the government has the right to exile natural born British subjects of the Japanese race, it must have that right to exile Scotsmen too. Jordan, show my next slide. Now, I used to think that these guys were um, just a bunch of old balding white guys, but then I became an old balding white guy myself. And so I never, I no, I no longer use that terminology. However, when Cartwright looked into, the, into, this, into this bench of white faces, he decided that what he needed was an argument not about persons of Japanese race, but about the vulnerability of the rights of, 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 the rights of Scotsmen. Here were the judges that listened to those arguments. Chief Justice Thibodeau Rinfret, Justices Patrick Kerwin, Albert Hudson, Robert Tashiro, Ivan Rand, Roy Kellogg, and James Esty all listened as Cartwright argued that this was an unconstitutional act. The 30 spectators that gathered in the court that day knew that they were witnessing history. It was the first case to be argued in this new building. But as the Toronto Star reported, the Chief Justice announced at the start of the hearing that there would be no ceremony to mark the occasion. And maybe this was the reason. The old desks and chairs battered from 30 years of use looked out of place in the modern courtroom, the Toronto Star reported. New furniture has been ordered, but hasn't arrived. And so in battered chairs and in a spectacular new monument built for justice, the case of a shocking injustice had begun. <laughs> 
Jordan? Thank you, Eric and Merica for the introductions. A shameful and important history, as Merrick has already suggested, underlies the events that Eric's talking about, underlies that moment in Canadian law. A year before the Supreme Court of Canada heard that case in February of 1946, a man named Tom Piggerskill circulated to sites of internment in British Columbia. Piggerskill had only just been hired as the Commissioner of Japanese Placement by the Department of Labor, and he'd been urged to take that job by his brother, Jack Piggerskill, who went on to a prominent career in the Canadian Civil Service and as a politician and cabinet member. Piggerskill's job was to circulate to the camps and to have discussions with Japanese Canadians. And the purposes of, the, of those discussions was to convince as many of them as possible to sign the so-called repatriation forms that uh, Eric's already described as pivotal to the orders in council and the legal case in 46. Japanese Canadians were given a choice. They could either relocate to Eastern Canada, a second forced uprooting of the community or accept exile to Japan. And Piggerskill was trying to ensure that as many as possible on direct uh, uh, um, instruction from his supervisors, as many as possible would sign those forms. Japanese Canadians had questions about what life in Canada would offer them and Piggerskill recorded his exchanges with them. If we go to Eastern Canada, Japanese Canadians asked at some of the camps, if we go to Eastern Canada, will we have freedom of enterprise and employment? We'll be able to open a business or take a job. Will, will we be able to rent and own property? The response from Piggerskill, a complete and satisfactory answer can't be given at this time. If we stay in Canada, will we enjoy freedom of movement after we've moved to Eastern Canada? Or will our movement still be restricted? Will we suffer some continuing form of internment? Details said Piggerskill of this have yet to be decided. In the event of racist violence, asked uh, Japanese Canadians, will we have protection of the law and of police? Piggerskill assured them that they'd have the normal protection of Canadian law, which would have offered them, I would think, little assurance after years of internment. Will our children be permitted to go to school? Japanese Canadians asked. That, said Piggerskill, is a matter of provincial jurisdiction, not dominion, so it's something I can't comment on. In sum, Japanese Canadians asked Piggerskill if they went to Eastern Canada, whether they would be citizens of Canada. And Piggerskill's answer to this is worth quoting at some length. To this question, he said, there are some details on which there is still some uncertainty. And because of this insecurity, the insecurity of Japanese Canadian citizenship, the government is offering generous provisions uh, uh, for repatriation to those voluntarily applying if they come to the conclusion that the outlook is not bright for staying in Canada. After this tour, Piggerskill wrote to his uh, uh, employers in the Department of Labor to tell them that he thought it had gone extremely well and that he anticipated as many as 80% of Japanese Canadians would sign the forms when the RCMP circulated in his wake. In the end, some 60% did sign over 10,000 people signed or had signed on their behalf uh, the repatriation forms. And so Piggerskill's tours in some ways, they answer the question of how we got to the Supreme Court in 1946 with 10,000 Japanese Canadians, almost half of the pre-war coastal population standing on the verge of exile from Canada. 10,000 Japanese Canadians signed forms ex accepting exile because they could not trust the Canadian government to regard them as citizens. They knew from years of internment that government uh, injustice within their lives could take many and diverse forms, could affect their opportunities for employment, education, property ownership, police protection, prop, uh, uh, um, political participation, and of course, freedom of movement. And federal officials deliberately gave them very little reason to think 
that these injustices would end if they moved uh, to Eastern Canada. Gave them very little reason to think that indeed the future was bright for them in Canada. So in a sense, that's the history underlying in a very direct sense, uh, the case that Eric's been talking about. But of course, behind that lies uh, further history. How did we get to this moment where Pickerskill circulated and officials treated so callously uh, Canadian citizens? And the answer to that could stretch, as Merrick has already suggested, over generations of history in British Columbia and in Canada as race was a fault line in this society from the founding of the province and indeed before. But I wanna to touch on one more proximate cause before uh, handing back to Eric. And that is the political decisions that preceded the exile during the internment era itself. And particularly the choice that, that rendered Japanese Canadians placeless, the destruction of their homes by the federal government. In 1942, when Japanese Canadians were uprooted and interned, they would assure that their property would be preserved and protected and returned to them at the end of the war. In 1943, the government instead elected to sell everything that they had been forced to leave behind. Their homes, businesses, personal belongings, the automobiles that you see here behind me on my screen were some of the first uh, forms of property that the federal government forced into sale. And as a result, in 1945, when officials came to contemplate what Japanese Canadians would do after the end of the war, after the end of the internment, they were faced with a problem of their own creation. Japanese Canadians could not go home. They had no homes to which to return. And Pickerskill's forms, the choice that he presented to Japanese Canadians was imagined as a solution to this problem of the government's own creation. Now, Japanese Canadians had recognized from the outset the danger of the destruction of their homes. And Eric's gonna talk about their legal resistance to that process. Thanks, Jordan. Do you wanna advance the slide for me? The, the exile case uh, that we're speaking about tonight on its 75th anniversary was not the first time Japanese Canadians found themselves in court constitutionally challenging the racist and repressive wartime measures that they faced. We have sometimes, I think, tended to approach the wartime internment era of racism against Japanese Canadians as a history of, of politics, politics gone bad, politics gone wrong. And certainly that's true. But it's also a story of law. It's, it's, it's law that forced Japanese Canadians from their homes and uprooted them. And it was law that took their property. And it was a law that was passed that, that, that authorized the sale of all of that property. The New Canadian reported on the efforts of the Japanese Canadian community to challenge the sale of that property. Despite facing the immense hardships of incarceration and internment, in 1943, Japanese Canadians began to pool what meager resources they could cobble together in order to raise the $8,500 that they knew they needed to hire a lawyer to begin to fight the dispossession of their property in court. What they called the Amalgamated Property Owners Association began to organize from various internment camps, Slocan, New Denver, Caslow, to raise the money, asking intern families to donate whatever they could, and they did. The APOA, that's that Amalgamated Property Owners Association, they selected then three representative plaintiffs. Jitaro Tanaka was a Japanese national who had been long resident in Canada. Ikichi Nakashima was a naturalized Canadian. He had lived in Canada for uh, many, many years and uh, taken out uh, citizenship as a British subject of Canada. And finally, in the next image Jordan will show, we have an image of uh, Tadao Wakabayashi and his family. Um, there's little Vivian, um, whom some of you may know, um, and uh, Tadao's wife, Ekiko. Tadao had been born in Canada and was a Canadian 
citizen by birth. Each of those individuals had cooperated with what was called the custodian of enemy property in doing what the government asked, which was handing over their extensive real property, their homes, and their personal properties for the government's care and control. The government had seized Tadao's and Akiko's Vancouver home on McGill Street. It had taken their furniture, Tadao's tools, uh, the 53 pieces of Japanese dishes, and a pair of ice hockey skates that he listed in his possessions in the forms that he filled out before he handed them over to the government. Delay beset the case challenging that seizure and sale of that property from the outset. And although the case was initiated in 1943, it was not heard in 19, until 1944, May of 1944 in Ottawa before the Exchequer Court of Canada. The lawyers on the call will now know that as the Federal Court of Canada. In the 1940s, it was still known as the Exchequer Court. The judge hearing Tadao's case was Justice Joseph Thorson, who until 1942 had been, actually been a member of Mackenzie's King wartime cabinet as Minister of National War Service. In some ways, what became known as the Nakashima case would be a rehearsal, just a rehearsal of the exile case to come. Lawyers for the Japanese Canadian litigants pointed out that the orders of dispossession and sale, which had promised to care for and return their property, could not be authorized by the War Measures Act, since neither dispossession nor sale had anything to do with the security of Canada. They could not be traced to the emergency of wartime. And since they were unconnected in any way to wartime, then they could not be authorized by the War Measures Act. The government argued in response that the decisions of the executive to pass orders which seized property or sold property were the necessary steps to deal with the war. And they could not, under any circumstances, be questioned by courts, so long as a government was willing to stand up and say, we deemed these orders advisable which the government lawyers were willing to do. Justice Thorson reserved his judgment after two days of hearing. The Japanese Canadian community waited for an answer that they hoped would undo the threatened sales of their property. And they waited, and they waited, and waited, and waited. More than three years went by, during which time the government sold every seized item of property, save for the property held by of the litigants, Tadao and Ekichi and Jatera. Every car, every home, every farm, every personal possession would ultimately be sold over the course of the 1940s. The delay in the decision by Justice Thorson even became the subject of comment in the House of Commons. Why has the case not been decided? The CCF, the party that became the NDP, wanted to know. The Minister of Justice responded this way. I regret these conditions of affairs. Some judges are slower than others. Perhaps the judge is taking more pains than others. Well, there was pain, um, but it wouldn't be pain experienced by Justice Thorson. At the end of August, 1947, more than three years after he heard the case, he finally released his short decision. Nakashima, Tanaka, Wakabayashi lost. Justice Thorson agreed with the government that courts could not question the, de the decisions of government in moments of war. Jordan? The terms of legal debate that we've heard uh, so far with um, lawyers on behalf of Japanese Canadian litigants arguing that the measures had no basis in security and instead were racist uh, law, 
that categories like the Japanese race were void. And the government presenting, on the other hand, its claim uh, that these were measures taken as a matter of security. Those differences have tended to characterize discussion of this topic since an explanation of events that happened in the 1940s, with some, as you've heard tonight, America, Eric, and I, all emphasizing the racism of the era and the role of racism in these events. And others, and whenever this, certainly whenever this issue is brought into public discussion in British Columbia, others countering, well, it was a time of war. You have to understand that people were afraid that uh, to look back and to judge as racist past actors is to, is to, is to engage in a kind of uh, presentism that does violence to the past. And I think actually that debate is a useful debate that can, that can continue on. What fissures exist within British Columbia or Canadian society that come to the fore at times of stress and times of pressure? And we've seen the increase in uh, anti-Asian racism over the last year that's just been in the press last week. Uh, um, and that kind, this kind of the contemplation of this history can bring us to, to think about those topics. And conversely, what do we owe each other even at times of stress and times of conflict? But I think actually the exile case and in some ways the dispossession before it, but especially the exile, um, it pushes us to search for other explanations uh, and, and to uh, engage in other forms of history that, 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 that perhaps push beyond a debate between racism and time of war. I'd ask that you consider this, for example, the, the contrast to the United States. So in the United States, uh, over 110,000 people in the continental United States were incarcerated, as many of you will know. In the United States, as in Canada, it was declared that Japanese American citizens on the basis of race could be considered disloyal or suspect of disloyalty and certainly um, denuded of some of their citizenship rights. In, Can in the United States, as in Canada, the courts supported the government in these endeavors. And in the famous Korematsu decision of 1944, the Supreme Court of the United States affirmed that military authorities could deem it a, it a necessity to uh, relocate people of, uh, of uh, citizens of Japanese ancestry. However, the United States never contemplated the mass exile of Japanese Americans. It never determined that Japanese Americans constituted a problem of placeness, placelessness that needed to be solved. It never seized and sold all of the property of Japanese Americans, rendering them placeless. Less than 1% of Japanese Americans were deported at the end of uh, the Second World War. And to my knowledge, no Japanese American citizens were deported against their own objections. Meanwhile, Canada sought to deport almost half of the pre-war coastal population and in the end, two out of five Japanese Canadians uh, in 1946 were slated for deportation at the time of the Supreme Court decision that Eric uh, has talked about. Most of them were citizens. Many had objected to their deportation. And this reality, I think, troubles both of those prior explanations that we often hear of these events. The United States was a racist society, very much at war. In Canada, we'll often hear, well, Pearl Harbor, I've been told Pearl Harbor was a game changer. Well, of course, that was an attack, in fact, on the United States. So why didn't the United States seek to exile Japanese Americans? Or if those causes weren't sufficient, why did Canada seek to, to deport so many Japanese Canadians? So I find two lines of answer convincing in response to these questions. The first is a political historical answer, which I'll defend against our legal historian and, uh, and certainly assert the importance of political process. And that's the, um, that's the line that I've already been suggesting and that Eric's remarks on the Nakashima case also remind us of, that Canada took contingent political decisions that might have gone otherwise, 
Canada might not have chosen to seize all the property of Japanese Canadians when they were uprooted. The United States didn't. It might, having seized that property, have chosen not to force its sale. That was, a, that was an option available to policymakers. Different people making those decisions might have chosen differently. And conversely, I can well imagine that in the United States where property seizure was contemplated, that the United States might well have followed that course. And so the specific decisions of people in positions of power in the course of these events matter and set a path forward, having made the decision to force the sale of the property of Japanese Canadians, officials then found necessary or indeed uh, at least acceptable to force their exile. And the second main line of, of answer might be legal historical. So there may be things about uh, law in Canada that permitted this, these excesses of Canadian politicians and civil servants. In the United States in 1944, at the very end of 1944, the Endo decision ran in a sense against Korematsu, although it didn't take that case on directly. The Supreme Court of the United States found in December of 1944 that American citizens of Japanese ancestry couldn't, uh, couldn't be held indefinitely by the War Le Relocation Authority. The court didn't question its prior argument that military officials could uh, uproot people from where they were living, but it did question that American uh, citizens like these at Tool Lake in this photograph could be held indefinitely in camps uh, like this. And so the Supreme Court in the United States found a limit. It, 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 it set a boundary on the draconian measures of the United States in this period. So I'd, put, I, I'd turn it back to Eric to ask this question. What of Canadian law, what boundary, if any, was placed on the mistreatment of Japanese Canadians by our courts? Well, I think that is the theme uh, of the exile case. Uh, we can think of it as a case about the limits of power, if there are any, in a constitutional democracy. One emerging from war, but no longer directly in a war. And it was precisely that argument to take you back to January 1946, that 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 Cartwright and the, the, and the Japanese Canadian litigants are trying to uh, force upon, not force, persuade the Supreme Court of Canada must be present in the Canadian constitutional system. Well, the exile case really, I think, begins uh, as, a, as, a, as a case in the, in the orders that the, the government was pressing ahead, the orders which authorized exile. And the only reason that the orders forcing exile came into existence was because so many Japanese Canadians had requested that their signing of the repatriation forms, which they had signed, as Jordan explained, under such incredible duress, be with, with, withdrawn. So as thousands and thousands of Japanese Canadians begin to say to the government, we no longer want to return to Japan, that's a bad deal. We signed those under duress. We want to remain uh, in Canada. The government knew that its policy of removing the Japanese Canadian population from the country in a permanent basis was now at risk. Their response was the orders in council authorizing deportation. But even in crafting those orders, the government realized that there was something called citizenship, which it may need to treat differently amongst different kinds of Canadians. And so the orders divided the Japanese Canadian community into a number of categories. Category number one was Japanese nationals, those persons who still had Japan citizenship. They may have been living in Canada for decades, Many of them did and had been, but they, were they, they had not yet become Canadian citizens. They were still citizens of Japan. Those individuals, the order said, were to be exiled regardless of any wishes that they may have to stay in Canada. The second category was naturalized 
British subjects of Canada. A naturalized citizen is somebody who arrives in Canada and becomes a citizen, usually by virtue of living in the country for um, two or three years. So again, a large number of Japanese Canadians were naturalized British subjects of Canada. The order said that those individuals could remain in Canada if they attempted to withdraw their repatriation forms prior to the official surrender of Japan, September of 1945. Not that many naturalized uh, uh, Canadians fell into that category. The third category was Canadian born persons um, who were of Japanese ancestry. That category, the government said, could withdraw their approval to exile at any point prior to receiving their orders of exile, which would stipulate the time and the date and the boat that they would be exiled on. So that was the category that was dealt with the most lenient, in a most lenient fashion. Why? Because the government is recognizing at some level that to make this a politically sellable um, uh, proposal, policy proposal on the broader public stage, they would need to treat Canadian citizens slightly differently than other categories. Whether any of these exiles were, were constitutional or not was now a question for the Supreme Court. Thus, said the Vancouver Daily Province, the question of Canada's Jap Japanese passes from the realm of prejudice and politics into the realm of law. It is well that it should be so. Great principles are involved, and it is important that action touching upon such principles be taken only after mature consideration and with the highest judicial sanction. That's what the Vancouver uh, province said on the eve of the Supreme Court case. Well, that judicial sanction arrived on February the 20th, 1946, 75 years ago yesterday. I wish it were a happier anniversary. Some judges, the Chief Justice and a handful of others would have found that the exile orders were constitutional in their entirety. They fixed those judges in particular on what they called the disloyalty exhibited by Japanese Canadians in signing the exile forms. In his judgment, Justice Hudson offered the offensive remark that the requests themselves meant that, quote, ties of race are stronger than obligations of nationality for Japanese Canadians. However, some semblance of citizenship rights, Canadian citizenship rights, did emerge in the opinions which would form the majority of the uh, court. In particular, the majority composed of Justices Kellogg and Estee, Hudson and Rand, advised that the provisions authorizing the exile of wives and children who had citizenship, but without their consent, was unconstitutional. It was not a power that could be known as lawful. Justice Rand said that anyone who is born in Canada cannot be deported in such a manner. It is simply an unlegal act. And since it is an unlegal act, it could not therefore be authorized by the War Measures Act, which only authorized lawful orders. And perhaps remembering that opening line, do you remember when Justice Cartwright tried to catch the attention of those judges by saying, what if this was a Scotsman? Well, here's what Justice Rand writes in his decision. I must deal with this case, he said, as if instead of a Canadian of national, a Canadian national of Japanese origin, I was dealing with that of a natural born Canadian of English extraction. And so, although much of the orders of exile were in fact upheld, the portions dealing with wives and children and the, and the, and who were citizens was denied constitutionality. And that rendered to a certain extent the entire enterprise that the Canadian government was trying to pull off with the exile more difficult 
how would it exile husbands but not their children? So Canada appealed. And remember when I said at the beginning of these remarks that Canada decided to put off the abolishing of appeals to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council until after the war? Well, that meant that the appeal to the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada went to the image on the screen in front of you. That is a shot of the law lords of Great Britain, all of the members of the House of Lords, most of them uh, former judges sitting in the House of Lords, who sat on a kind of super appeal committee for the entire British Commonwealth, hearing cases from around the world, India, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And in July of 1946, the Canadian lawyers representing Japanese Canadians and the Canadian government donned their British style lawyer wigs, as is the fashion, and argued before the Judicial Committee, and in particular, the uh, judges Georgian is now going to show you, argued in front of these gentlemen that the exile orders were unconstitutional from the perspective of Japanese Canadians or constitutional in all aspects, said the government of Canada. Well, in a decision written by the gentleman in the chair in the middle, that's Lord Wright, who uh, the exile case would be among his last cases ever heard. And it was um, uh, his uh, decision, which was released in uh, December of 1946. Another member of that court was uh, Chief, former Chief Justice uh, Lindman Poole Duff. He's the gentleman uh, standing in front of the bust beside Lord Wright. Justice Duff was a Canadian. And on Privy Council appeals, there would often be a retired Canadian judge um, or a sitting Canadian judge of the Supreme Court of Canada that heard these appeals. Justice Duff heard the appeals um, as a member of the Privy Council but was himself a uh, Canadian. In its decision released in 1946, the Privy Council decided that notions of citizenship mattered not at all. In answer to Jordan's question, there were no limits on the sovereign powers of a government operating in a time of war or even in a time after the war when dealing with supposed security issues that emerged from that war. Next slide, Jordan. The Parliament of the Dominion, in a sufficiently great emergency, Lord, White, Lord Wright wrote, such as that arising out of a war, has the power to deal with that emergency for the safety of the Dominion as a whole. The interests of the Dominion are to be protected, and it rests with the Parliament and the Dominion to protect them. What those interests are, the Parliament of the Dominion must be left with considerable freedom to judge. In other words, the rights and the freedoms at issue in the exile case were not those of Japanese Canadians. They were those of Parliament and of Cabinet to enact whatever measures they pleased in the name of war, no matter how harmful, no matter how racist no matter how unjust. And yet, if I'll end my remarks before handing it off to Jordan with a glimmer of hope, here's the wisdom of the Japanese Canadian community, which persisted through the injustices of this injustice. The new Canadian writing right after the Supreme Court of Canada released its decision, 75 years ago, another anniversary of this uh, uh, opinion, uh, the one I prefer to remember um, in the New Canadian, is that legal decisions are not an ending. They are often just a beginning. And losing in court does not mean losing an argument. The Constitution is in the hands of all of us. And Japanese Canadians would not stop the fight, despite the fact that they had lost at the Privy Council and that the exile orders had been upheld. It was just another stop along the long road of fighting for their constitutional rights.
this is an image of uh, some Japanese Canadians awaiting, awaiting exile with their baggage. The, uh, in the end, between May 31st and December 31st, 1946, five ships departed from Vancouver, carrying 3,965 Japanese Canadians into exile. Ultimately, despite the permission of the Privy Council, the Liberal government ended deportations there. The, uh, the remaining 6,000 Japanese Canadians were not deported. And that was due to, uh, in this remarkable moment that, that Eric has talked about as the new Canadian voiced their outrage at the legal decision, so too finally did many other uh, Canadians. And similar thoughts were expressed in the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star and papers across Canada. And ultimately the exile, though lawful according to the Canadian courts, was deemed a sufficient political liability that it ceased uh, in 1946. The, a ship scheduled to depart in 1947 uh, did not. But this came too late for many exiles, uh, many Japanese Canadians who had hoped not to be forced into exile. Uh, some of their uh, lives and experiences at the time are beautifully expressed by Ken Adachi in his enduring work on the 1940s uh, and, and the racism prior to the 1940s in Canada. Uh, Adachi wrote about, uh, conveyed the feeling of a number of Japanese Canadians at the time, including Shinzo Tanaka, who when the officials came to his camp at Lemon Creek, a desolate barren uh, internment camp, uh, signed the form indicating that he would accept exile to Japan. So did 90% of people at Lemon Creek who lived still in desperate uh, conditions at the time. Tanaka and many others soon regretted the decision that they had made. He wrote to friends back in Canada shortly after his arrival in Japan. On landing in uh, Ugara, uh, Uraga, sorry, a port near uh, Tokyo, he wrote, we were taken by trucks to a receiving center. There were 30 buildings, each measuring about 30 to 50 feet. We were given a blanket and a small pillow. We were told that this year had been the worst for food shortages as a means of justifying the meager provisions that they had. The bleak experience, he wrote, filled us with an indescribable feeling of hopelessness. Years and indeed decades of hardship followed for thousands of Canadians like Tanaka who had been required in 1945 to make an impossible and unfair choice, a choice that had, should never have been forced upon them. Tanaka and others were failed by the prime minister and cabinet. They were failed by civil servants entrusted to safeguard their well-being. And indeed, as we've seen, they were failed by the courts. Theirs is a story of the failure of Canadian law. And that's the end of our formal remarks and we'll be very happy to take questions from, from the audience. Thanks very much, Eric and Jordan. Uh, that was certainly very educational for me. I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please send, uh, send in a text, uh, send in a chat message, or if you'd like to ask questions anonymously, please feel free to send me a direct message and I will I'll, uh, ask those questions on, on your behalf. So I'll, I'll just uh, get us started here, if that's okay, uh, while everyone else um, ponders that. Has there ever been an explicit this was a uh, disavowal of these decisions by the judiciary in, in Canada. Um, thanks for the question, uh, Sarah. Um, several years uh, after the judgment in the exile case, um, Justice Rand had uh, uh, re revisited th this opinion in, in, in the later 1950s. And remember, Justice Rand was, was one of the judges at the Supreme Court who tried to suggest there may be some form of, of citizenship rights that would, that would limit 
or provide a check on some governmental power. And, and looking at the Privy Council decisions, which, which followed obviously from his, his Supreme Court decision, he wrote that effectively the Judicial Committee decision meant that the government could take whatever powers it wanted um, in the time of war. That, that was Justice Rand. And I, I always, whenever I read that sentence in Justice Rand, I feel like I, I see his shoulders kind of slump um, this, this, this effort um, that, uh, that he had tried to write into Canadian law um, had, had failed. But the absolute concept of, of parliamentary uh, supremacy was done in by uh, the Charter of Rights and, and Freedoms. And, and so it is, it is no longer the case that Canada has a constitutional system in which any decision uh, made by parliament uh, will be deemed lawful no matter what the consequences. Um, in uh, Charter jurisprudence, we have a new model of adjudication, which says that where rights are infringed, the government must justify those infringements as demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So that has uh, changed. That won't always ensure that rights are protected, and it won't always ensure that courts get it right. But it does create a mechanism to make these arguments, I think, more explicitly. So how have courts dealt with the exile cases? Um, they have dealt with them largely by attempting to ignore them to death. Um, they're, they're not cited. Um, there's been no disavowal that uh, I know of. Um, and to go back to maybe Judge Omatsu's opening remarks, they've also been, I think, forgotten in the law school curriculum in a way that's unfortunate. I think um, this is an important part of Canada's legal history. It's important for Canadian lawyers and Canadian lawyers to be to know about the dispossession and exile cases. And um, I'll leave it there. Sarah, I see a couple of questions there in the chat that I could address from uh, Winston uh, Sason and then uh, Jane Kum uh, Kumamori. So uh, Winston asked what Canada has done to rectify the injustice to the families uh, directly affected by the policy. And um, we have a couple of people, including um, uh, Judge Umatsu and Art, Art Mickey, I see, I think I saw somewhere in our list, but I would, I would say that the, 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 the um, redress committee, the Canadian redress committee in the 1980s and then into the 1990s did a, did a remarkable thing in my view in going to Japan and seeking to uh, locate and involve Japanese Canadian exiles in the redress agreement. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, exiles received uh, along with Japanese Canadians, the uh, compensation eligible exiles received uh, compensation uh, um, along with Canadians. And so I think that that was a, a remarkable uh, gesture of the Japanese Canadian uh, community. It didn't, uh, none of that um, was meant to rectify and certainly on economic terms, didn't rectify the harms um, suffered by um, exiles the one of the the i guess the only existing book dedicated solely to the topic is tetsuo kage's book uh which been translated into english as uprooted again and he documents the 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 um, economic devastation of uh japanese canadians including uh through the um the uh currency conversion that was applied by the uh the American occupying authority when Japanese Canadians got there and gave them a terrible conversion rate on their on their Canadian currency and just arriving to uh, to war ravaged Japan. So certainly, as in the case of Japanese Canadians here in Canada, that um, settlement did not rectify those uh, harms, but it was an acknowledgement of them. And then, um, Jordan, yep. Now, now's the part where you say that we're writing a book on this topic. <laughs> That is true. We're, we're writing a book on this topic. Yeah. So there is going to be a, 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 a more recent book dealing with the exile of Japanese Canadians um, that uh, is underway. Yes. Um, 
And then uh, a really nice comment. Thank you uh, from Jane, uh, who compliments the talk, and then asks a little bit more about the contingencies that led to um, the Canadian government's seizure and sale of property. So uh, the uh, there are, I think the process is filled with contingencies. Uh, one that I'll just point to is the seizure of property itself. So the, uh, the government had formulated in late February of 1942, its plans for the uprooting and internment of Japanese Canadians. And there were many departments of government involved, you know, in this effort to uproot and intern with the Department of Labor playing the key role but other departments also involved. And nowhere contemplated in that law that was being circulated in late February was any um, vestiture of property in the federal government, any seizure of property. The property wasn't mentioned at all. And the custodian of enemy property wasn't mentioned as one of the agencies that would be relevant to the uprooting and internment of Japanese Canadians. They circulate that draft law in late, Mar in late uh, February. I think it circulates on February 28th um to uh to various folks who might be pertinent who should see a copy of it before it's passed into law and one of them is a fellow named austin taylor who's going to be the head of the agency the bcsc responsible for the uh internment of japanese uh, canadians and taylor is a millionaire who's sort of working for the federal government on a on a voluntary uh, basis essentially and is uh, rumored at the time to have purchased a million dollars worth of um, uh, war bonds. So he's a rich person who presumably thinks a lot about property. And he sends a telegram to one of the cabinet members, Ian McKenzie, who's responsible for moving this policy through and says, it's just a one line tele telegram says something like, I presume you're doing something with the property. And at that point, the government st starts to scramble to figure out what to do with, um, with property. Austin Taylor's worried about it. He's someone of consequence. So they send it to, to, uh, to the um, uh, to law, to the uh, Ministry of Justice to insert uh, something about property. And, uh, and a line gets inserted saying all the property will be vested in the federal government. That is passed into law on March 4th. So just days after Taylor's telegram and the original authors of the, of the law, of the draft law, uh, an original author of the draft law is outraged that property has been inserted in this way with no due consideration to the rights of property holding Canadians and writes a letter of outrage uh, about this. But essentially, if, if that uh, uh, law, as written by John Erskine Reed, uh, who's the fellow who got outraged, if that law had passed, then the property would not have been vested. And as in the case of the United States, it would have been left to Japanese Canadians, perhaps to arrange leases, perhaps to uh, sell the property on their own terms, to manage their own property as they saw fit. Instead, with Taylor's last minute intervention, they insert a single line that vests the property in uh, the federal government, and to my view, uh, leads to leads to the uh, leads to the exile. Okay, maybe I'll take the next one, Jordan. Yep. What's been done in the legal framework of Canada that could help in preventing such things happening again? One of those things I think is the charter, which I spoke about all, already. So, uh, a, a, you know, important constitutional change has altered the fundamental framework. Uh, but the other is the War Measures Act itself uh, was repealed um, in the 1980s, uh, replaced with the Emergencies Act. We sometimes see reference to the Emergencies Act today in the context of the pandemic. Um, but the, the Emergencies Act is less uh, sweeping than the War Measures Act. And it has not been, uh, I, th I think I'm right on this, it has not been proclaimed or used since, since being enacted. And so the, the treatment of Japanese Canadians, I think propelled the appearance of the Canadian Charter. Um, in, and, I, and I've made those arguments in some of, my, some of my scholarship, but it also, I think, had an impact on, on, on the, um, illeg illegitimacy of the War Measures Act. Um, now, it didn't end it in the 1940s because people will know that it was used in the 1970s 
against Quebec um, nationalists, but but it, it was part of a longer story that said Canada needed change. Eric, our colleague in Kyoto, uh, Dr. Azumi has sent a great question that I don't know the answer to and see whether you do. But as I read her question, you know, uh, well, I'll read it just directly, but I sort of have interpretations as well. But at the same time that this protest against the deportation of Japanese, um, uh, against the deportation of Japanese Canadians was occurring, the Canadian Citizenship Act was being discussed in Parliament, which took effect on January 1st, 1947. Did this law strengthen the protection of citizens and did this uh, law affect the treatment of Japanese Canadians? So um, it's a perceptive comment because it, 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 the placement of the citizenship debates in, in right after the war, 1946 and in 1947, as parliament is creating this new citizenship law for Canada. Before Canada has its own citizenship law, uh, Canadians, there is such a thing as Canadian citizenship, but it, it's through a number of, of old laws which deal with people being British subjects um, and Canadian nationals, but no clear explicit Canadian Citizenship Act. So that's being debated after the war. And while that's being debated, um, this moment of, 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 of the politics uh, and, and legal challenge of exile is unfolding. And those two conversations were wrapped up in one another. Um, so in Parliament, they're saying, how can we have a meaningful citizenship law if, on the other hand, we are stripping people of citizenship, citizenship and exiling them? And in the press reports that begin to turn against exile, one of the strong arguments that they're using is we're, we are gaining a new citizenship. Surely, if that citizenship is to mean anything, it has to mean that we will not be exiling our citizens, regardless of their race. And so the Citizenship Act had a powerful role in the form of rhetoric and ideas in an aspiration that we should be equal in citizenship. But the Citizenship Act itself did not grant additional protections to citizens. Um, it was more in the form of an idea that, that had its real impact. And Laura Saimoto, our colleague, uh, uh, has uh, a, a related question, I think, uh, Eric, around, uh, uh, Sarah, are, are, you meant, are you, you're meant to be <laughs> shepherding these through, but I've been jumping in, but I, I'll... <laughs> I'm, no, I, I think you're doing a great job. I had a, a related question, which was that I didn't, um, I practice immigration law. And uh, one of the things that I did not see in those decisions was any kind of a min meaningful distinction between a permanent resident and uh, a citizen. And um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on, or, or um, comments on whether that ex uh, distinction existed at the time because it's certainly a distinction that's made now and, and uh, as uh, current Canadian immigration and citizenship law certainly affords uh, the same protection to citizens, uh, whether they're born in Canada or naturalized with very some very small um, limitations there, but uh, permanent residents, you know, they theoretically could be deported if they were to commit some serious crimes uh, while living in Canada, even if they've been here for um, 30, 40 years. So uh, just uh, do you have any thoughts on if that distinction existed at the time and uh, whether that distinction made a difference in those judgments? Thank you, Sarah. Um, you're right that it's it's absent from the decision in part because I think they're thinking in very blunt categories. Are you a Japanese national? Are you a Canadian citizen by naturalization? Are you a Canadian citizen by birth? That was really the only categories that they had in mind. And, and there were no further distinctions in that category of, of Japanese nationals of those who may have permanent residency or, or not. Um, I don't know when that concept comes into uh, legal currency. Uh, it, it may be in the 47 Act. I'd have to see, and you may, you may know better than, than I do. It's certainly present 
in 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 contemporary law law of of, of immigration and and plays a large role. Um, so there there would have been and I just forget the expression now. There there would have been a concept of um, of some that that nationals of another country could achieve a kind of of status in Canada short of um, citizenship where they were able to, to live and work here um, uh, permanently. But I don't think that they use the expression permanent resident. I'm not sure when that arose. Maybe there are others on the call who know that history better than I do. Well, they, they did use the, the phrase permanent resident in the decision, but she didn't seem to make the distinction between a permanent resident and I think a naturalized uh, a Canadian citizen. So I, I, as you say, the, the distinction that was in the judge's mind seems to be a, a racist distinction, which we can say with hindsight. Yeah, no question about that. Yeah, there are a couple of people on the call who may, may know better than I as well. But my my sense is that 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 permanent residency as a category in immigration process did not exist at that time, and I'm not sure when it when it uh, came into uh, came into effect. I think there 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 is in law though a distinction in this period between someone who's visiting Canada and is a, and is a national of another country and someone who resides in Canada and is a national of another country. And the Japanese Canadians who were who were Japanese citizens, some of them, uh, you know, would have been here for decades. Yeah, almost all. Yeah. Jordan, uh, what's the next question for us? Or I'll let Sarah. I'll, 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 I'll read. Yeah. I'll just read out a, a question here. So this is from Marianne. My question is likely likely for Eric regarding Japanese Canadian women in the Supreme Court of Canada and. Uh, JCPC decisions. Do you think coverture matters here or the ghost of coverture? The result of the JCPC decision is that married women would not need to consent to their expat expatriation. Their husbands could choose for them. Yes, thanks, Marianne. Great question and also a perceptive one because I think that's right. And, and this idea that women were not in charge of their legal destiny it appears in so many places in, in Canadian law. And it's long had a role in citizenship law, as, um, as historians in this area will know, that, that women would often lose their citizenship depending on the status of their husbands, or that women could gain citizenship based on the status of their husbands. And that concept was one that was replicated in um, sexist and racist fashion in the Indian Act, in which, in which uh, status Indian women would lose their status if they married um, a non-status uh, man, but the reverse was true. A, a, a status, uh, Indian status man would be able to give status to a non-status woman whom he married and their children would have that status. So the idea that women were not full legal persons, both in terms of their ability to, con to contract in some in some forms, um, and 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 for the for the purposes of some um, uh, family law matters, um, and in some uh, matters relating to uh, uh, criminal law and, and evidence giving, um, all of those touch points happen throughout the law, and this is another place where we see women are being treated as not full legal citizens. Thanks, Eric. So this question is from Laura, and I'll just paraphrase a little bit here. Um, the, uh, the JCPC is, um, and the JCPC, as she understands it, was the final decision maker. Is this still the case today? So the the Privy Council ceases being Canada's highest court of appeal in 1949. So finally that plan from before the war to abolish appeals comes back um, onto Parliament's agenda in 1947. And the, the Privy Council uh, right after the um, exile case, um, I think 
even within weeks or months, I forget the exact timing, but very shortly after the exile case, here's a case about whether or not um, they can be abolished and they decide that they can be. They, they effectively sign their own constitutional death warrant um, and then Canada abolishes those uh, appeals. Um, so the, it, it, it was worded such that any case that was initiated after 1949 could not be appealed to the Privy Council. So I actually think the last case that the Privy Council ever heard was in about the mid 1950s. Um, and the, the institution still exists today. There's a small number of countries who still use the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, um, but there are not very many left. I think another dimension of that question, and I'll just put this to Eric again, since uh, this is why it's good to work with a legal historian. Uh, but um, I think another part of her question is about the fate of parliamentary supremacy. So, uh, and, and whether the kind of supremacy accorded to uh, Parliament in a time of conflict would still pertain today. Well, there are certainly those who uh, think that um, the security mindset can still overwhelm constitutional rights in moments of, of either genuine or perceived insecurity. And, and some would say that some of the um, measures, uh, anti-terrorism measures after 9-11 uh, interfered with individuals' rights in a way in which the security mindset was uh, present. Um, there are, there's a handful of cases in which um, when dealing with whether or not the limitation on rights is reasonable or not, the court has sometimes uh, seemed to put themselves in, in the position of, of saying the government knows best when, when national security is at risk. And of course, I've been arguing for this last um, 10 months that um, there are gonna be moments of insecurity when, when governments need to interfere with rights. And you, you only need to think about uh, pandemic lockdowns and um, the closures of, of religious institutions and churches, um, and the limiting of, of liberty of movement um, and travel. All of those things come at a cost of our, of our rights and freedoms. Um, but are they justified? Uh, and in a pandemic, um, I'm of the view that the, the answer to date so far has been yes, justified infringements. But I'm glad I live in a society that asks the question of governments to justify their infringements. Um, ultimately, if we're faced with new moments of insecurity when racism takes hold, or the most vulnerable among us suffer the greatest deprivations, what you hope is that there is a legal system in which there are lawyers and judges who stand taller than they did in, 1940, in the 1940s to say that those actions are not justified. And, and that's the mechanism that was fundamentally missing from uh, the exile case. Hey, we're almost out of time. I just want to read one last comment here from Sally Ito. Um, Marianne, anecdotally in my family, my grandmother did not want to go to Japan with her Japanese national husband who intended to repatriate. In order not to go, she was told she would have to divorce her husband. She did not do this because she did not want her family of five boys to be separated from her as they would have to have gone with their father. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think we, we just got, I, I'll ask this one last question and then wrap up. This is from Masumi Izumi. Did the justices in the Supreme Court of Canada intend to make it difficult for the Canadian government to deport unwilling Japanese Canadians by deciding that the wives and children could not be deported because they did not sign the repatriation form or, or were they making a purely legal judgment? Um, great question, Masumi. Um, is, are they crazy like a fox, right? Uh, did the Supreme Court of Canada say, well, most of this is constitutional, but not this fundamental part. And we knew that in 
denying the fundamental part, you would throw a throw a wrench into the into the operation in a way that was kind of an artful decision, which 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 clarified that the government had powers in times of war, but not total and complete powers, that there were some limits and that those limits could be could be reached. Um, I we, we, we're not gonna know the answer to your great question because um, the, the records uh, do not exist that would disclose it. Um, and we don't have the, the personal reminiscence, reminiscences of those judges. And even if we did, they wouldn't talk about their decision-making process. So certainly it's possible that um, that, that was on the mind of some of the Canadian judges. Um, give a little to government and take something away. Um, ultimately, of course, the Privy Council um, comes to a different conclusion. There is a, a one phrase in the decision where they, uh, on the subject of wives and children, the Supreme Court of Canada decision comments that with, with respect to wives and children, there's an element of compulsion which cannot be justified and then certainly did not, um, that did not, um, for whatever reason, did apply to every other category that was um, that they were rendering a decision on. So we're almost we're just about out of time. So I would really I, I'd like to thank Eric and Jordan uh, for the wonderfully informative talk, and uh, Judge Amatsu for uh, making the time to offer introductory remarks and um, and introduce the two speakers here today. And I would urge everyone to just uh, check out the Faculty DC website. I'm out of time, so I don't want to. Uh, okay, uh, Daniel, our student coordinator is sharing some links on the chat box there. And uh, we also have some upcoming events. Uh, one, the, the next one is on uh, a round table on in-house counsel. It's called the uh, the General Counsel Fireside Series. So that is about me, uh, everything for me. Uh, thanks, Daniel. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And thank you to the speakers. Well, let, let me just end to the world out there by saying thanks for spending some of your computer time with us tonight. It was a great honor and a pleasure and, and a particular thanks to, to Sarah for uh, and Daniel for their organization and the invitation and to Judge Amatsu for being here with us and um, really uh, Judge Amatsu, as you know, your inspiring role in, in this history and in this community is something that uh, Jordan and I have long um, looked up to. So thanks for your, your involvement tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a good evening. It was a very interesting talk as I promised it would be. Oh, I forgot Mike Abbe too. Um, Mike with the Landscapes of Injustice team. Um, thank you, Mike, for everything you continue to do. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night.